you know, I made a lot of mistakes. I have lost deals. I mean, I have fetal position, thought I was going to die because I've lost deals because of how stupid I am and saying the wrong things. I mean, I lost one this, this, this fall because I said exactly the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time. Oh, uh, exactly what happened? Congratulations, you've got a product, a great product, and now you need to make sales, big sales. But how are you gonna do that? You don't know anyone to sell to. Well, meet Seamless AI. Seamless connects you to B2B business professionals so you can sell your product to people you've only dreamed about. You can use the search engine to build a massive B2B contact list. How about doing a social media search on LinkedIn? Maybe go to your dream client's website and use the Chrome extension. Wherever you work, wherever you search, Seamless will find anyone you need, anywhere you need, instantly. Now, you've just got to sell that product. Join Seamless for free today. Make sure you smash that subscribe button, follow button, so that you get notified of episodes, behind the scenes footage every single day we publish. That will probably piss off Jeb to publish every hour. Hello and welcome to this episode of Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. And I'm thrilled to have with me today, Jeb Blunt. Jeb is currently the CEO at Sales Gravy, one of the top sales training and enablement companies in the world to help companies maximize their sales. He's also the author of many books, 13 books, including his newest number one best international seller of virtual training or virtual selling, right? And he's got the new virtual training Bible coming out the art of conducting powerful virtual training that enables learners, engages learners and makes knowledge stick, which is set for release, I think, I believe this July 14th. In 2020, Jeb was named the top 25 sales leader to follow. Uh, he's also the host of the Sales Gravy podcast, one of the top podcasts listened in the world. He's a big keynote speaker. He runs the Outbound Conference that's coming up in a few months. His years of experience in the sales industry, he's probably the most published sales author in the space. Honored to be here. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time. Well, it's, it's uh, absolutely a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm truly grateful. And congratulations on your brand new book. It's been a huge hit. And uh, and hold it up. There we go. We can all see that. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. It, Jeb, Jeb wrote most inspiring business book of the year. Thank you so much, man. I, I truly appreciate that. And uh, for those, you know, before the show started, I was just talking about Jeb. Jeb is possibly the hardest working sales guru, expert, influencer in the space that I've ever come across, not only from writing, coaching, teaching. He's got a studio of shit, eight different sets, it feels like. He's always in the recording studio for video, audio content, coaching content, masterminds, you name it. Dude, it's awesome to have you. How did this all start? Let's just dive in and cut through the bullshit, man. You know, I made a lot of mistakes. I have lost deals. I mean, I have fetal position, thought I was going to die because I've lost deals because of how stupid I am and saying the wrong things. I mean, I lost one this 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 fall because I said exactly the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time. Oh, uh, exactly what happened? Wrong I created, just, I created a, a moment where in a high stakes situation where people needed to feel absolutely confident in our ability at Sales Gravy to deliver for them. In a moment of feeling insecure, I said something that was a little bit more passive and I, and I created uh, doubt in the minds of these stakeholders yeah. and uncertainty, and it caused them to pause and initially go work with somebody else. Now, the beautiful thing for me is my competitor absolutely screwed things up. And we had built enough trust up to that point that we were able to win. But but it was partly because they were the, that competitor was a really, really big company. And you can probably relate to this, right? So a really, really big company with a long track record. They were the yeah. safe choice. And yeah. we were not the safe choice. And so in the middle of that, I just, I did what people do sometimes. I said the wrong thing. And and it, it created enough doubt where they said... They, that that's not going to work for us. And what you what you really want to think about is human negativity bias. When we were competing against the big competitor, they were looking for the right. They were looking at the reasons why they should work with a big competitor. They were looking for the reasons why they shouldn't work with us. And I gave them one. 
It wasn't mm-hmm. a big one. It was small. It was nuanced. If you had heard the, 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 the conversation, you would have said, I didn't hear anything wrong there. But I knew the moment that I said it, what I'd done. I knew it. It was it was How'd there, you bounce so. back from that? Because it sounds yeah. like you were able to win them. Like so so when that when you make a mistake in sales in the sales system, process pitching, whatever, you know, how do you optimize so you avoid that in the future? Well, you, you have to learn from it, you know, and sometimes I'm, I'm like I said, I'm not the smartest person in the world. Sometimes I have to learn lessons several times in a row. So, you know, I got to get bruised okay. a few times. But in this case, what we did was when we lost, we do what we always do. We sat down with the customer and said, because we're I mean, we're selling the right way. So it's not like we're creating enemies in the process. We sat down and said, OK, we lost. Tell us what we did. And they explained it to us. And it was a gut punch like this. I mean, I, I knew intuitively the mistake that I'd made. I didn't know until after we lost the deal that that was the mistake that killed the deal. So they came back and told us, connected yep. the dots, and we listened. And and this was interesting. As we were listening, they said, we really like you guys. We want to find some other ways we might be able to work together. That was good. you know. So, right. so, so we just maintained the relationship and we stayed in the hunt and we were gracious and we were kind. And, and then we came back and said, as a group, we all sat down as a group and said, you know what, we have got to do a better job of being a safe choice. We're, we're, we've, we've been this scrappy little boutique, you know, company that just does things our way. We don't, we don't sell things the way everybody else does. And we've been blessed. I mean, we have grown, I mean, our growth has been insane. Like, I I mean, hyper growth at a a rate that you would never imagine. And we're, and we're profitable. But I sat down with my leadership and said, we have to do this. We have to be the safe choice. We have to, we have to shift the way we're selling because we're getting into deals that we were never in before because of who we are. And yep. so we went back, learned from it, and we've been winning some monster deals since then because we just changed yeah. our approach a little bit. So so I, I think that I think that the, if I want to wrap that in a bow, you're going to win, you're going to lose. You should be learning on both sides of the equation. How, where, how are you motivated and where did this all start for you? Well, I mean, the, the, from from a selling standpoint, I started selling stuff in high school. I mean, I've always sold stuff, so uh, so I've you know that's that's just kind of been a natural thing, and I just felt like and I found that I'm good at this. And I always tell people I'm only really good at two things: horses and selling, and that's it. And there's nothing horses? else. And horses. I'm I'm I t- horses. You know, horses and people are a lot alike. So okay. if you can learn how to work with horses, you can learn how to work with people. So I, I'm totally into horses. So that's where I throw all my money. I just you know, throw them at horses. I love horses. Wow. But like horse racing, or like your family owns a bunch of horses, or like what does that? Mean? I, I own a bunch of horses. So I don't, not horse racing, but I buy horses that have raced. So I just bought a brand new horse just off the track. Who? Uh, and I, but I fox hunt. So I'm I'm. It's my my passion is. We chase coyotes, but we fox hunt. So all the I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people out that are throwing rocks at me right now because you know of, of, of animal stuff. But that's what I do, and I, and I, but I love I love horses. And I, I love being around them. So hunter jumpers are really my passion. And but the but horse you know dealing with horses and dealing with sales and dealing with people. There's a lot of analogies in there, and if you read my books, you'll read some analogies between how you deal with people and horses. So. For, for example, you know, I've always walked people through the analogy. If you've ever been around horses and you've ever been leading a horse, sometimes a horse will just stop and you can pull on it as hard as you want to and it will not move. Yeah. But if you simply take the horse under its chin, redirect it a few inches and walk that way, you can walk it right back on the path you were going to take it before. Same thing with wow. people, right? You get into a pitch battle with another human being. You cannot argue that, that, that person into believing they're wrong. But if you just redirect the conversation someplace else, you can get right back on track again and avoid that pitch battle that you cannot win. So there's a lot to do with horses, but back to like, how did I do this? How to get into this? I just, I got this asked this question earlier and I'm like, I don't have like some awareness of I'm some weird path. I've been just driven by ambition my entire life. Back in, you know, back in the days, you probably don't remember this because you're way younger than me and better looking. But no. uh, but but there used to be uh, this guy named Jim Rohn, and Jim had this uh, this uh, this audio course called Ambition. I feel and like everyone talks about this guy, Jim yeah. Rohn. Victor Antonio says the same thing about this. Yeah. Jim guy. Jim Rohn's amazing, but he had this this audio program called Ambition, and it was on cassette tapes. And I remember listening to that. I was a sales manager in uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, and I would go. My, part of my sales team was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and up and down I forty, I would listen to that thing over and over and over again. Because all I, you know, all I wanted to do was, you know, just move forward and advance and 
and grow. And that's exactly what I did. So, so for me, it was, you know, it was just a, it was just a drive. And I've always had that, that drive to essentially out hustle everybody else. Cause I'm not the smartest person I've never been. I'm certainly not the best salesperson in the world. I am better looking than Anthony Anarino. And that's just something that I, that God gave me, but I, you know, I didn't like, I didn't make that happen. Um, and, but, you know, but, but like the, I learned early on that, that it doesn't make a difference. I, I remember, for example, being in the corporate world with people who had graduated from these really top universities. And I went mm. to, to a small school in Georgia that, you know, no one's ever heard of. Yeah. And I would be with people that had been to Wharton, you know, and got out of Stanford and USC and I, and these, they all have MBAs and I'm competing with them. And, I, and I'm thinking I'm never, ever going to advance past these people. And three years later, they're all working for me. Right. <laughs> so what, right. You know, what's, what was the difference? I'm like, I would stay later. They would all go home and I'd still be at the office. And I would get, I would come home at nine o'clock at night and I would be at the office at four o'clock the next morning. Nobody could outwork me. Nobody can out hustle me. And that's, that's basically what, you know, what has been my drive all along is I don't have all the talent and things that everybody else has, but I can outwork you. And that's the one thing that I, that I can always beat you at. So, so for me, like that's, that's the drive. Like in, you know, writing books, I don't know, man. I, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, yeah, I've just, somebody asked my wife. Cause it, it's ago. painful, right? Like yeah. dude, writing a book is painful and hard and brutal. And you're like the master guru at it's, these it's, amazing. It's awful. Books. Well, my, my, we were at a party the night ago and, and uh, one of the people there asked my wife, she was sitting not too far from me, but I heard her say it. Um, they, they said, what, you know, what's Jeff's next book? And, and she said, well, you're probably going to have to ask his next wife because, because <laughs> all the people around you, like the people in your life, like they yeah. suffer too. Yeah. And, uh, like this past weekend, I spent Saturday and Sunday all day from the time I woke up until I went to bed writing. And I'm, I'm just a miserable, awful human being. I, I'm, I hate myself and I hate the world. It's, uh, it's not yeah. easy. I, I don't, I don't know why, but I'm compelled to do it. So yeah. I'm like, I, I have another idea and I have another idea and I have another idea. Some of it, though, I think if we're just honest with ourselves and I don't know the, for you, but for me, it's I always fear at some point that if I don't keep writing and I don't keep talking about these issues and iterating the content that you become irrelevant, like you're no longer what you're talking about is no longer any good. And I, I just want to be. The, the, the person that people look at and say, everything that I'm doing is fresh and new and it connects. But at the same time, I never forgot that there are basic building blocks in sales. For example, the more people you have conversations with, the more you're going to sell. Pretty yeah. simple, right? Yeah. I don't want to lose that at the same time. I'm having a conversation with someone about techniques for using direct messaging to move from a text conversation to an email conversation to a video conversation and close a deal internationally at the same time. How can you be faster, more efficient in our brave new world? So I just, it's a, it's a weird, weird thing. I, you know what? Let's just break it down. I'm mentally ill. The, the only reason anybody it. writes books is they're mentally ill. Yeah, man, it's crazy. And like what, when you started, so what you, you said you started selling in high school, and that, like, did you know you were always going to be a salesperson, like from the beginning or what was your journey? Like, like a lot of people may not know your journey. They just see the books, they see the awards, they see the training, all that jazz. Like walk me through your life, this transition. Well, um, you know, early on, I, um, I, when I got out of school, when I was in school, I worked for several companies. So I worked all the way through college. And, awesome. and so I had a, I pretty much had a full-time job and, and I went to school full-time. So your parents were like, I'm going to give you all this money. You don't need to worry about anything. Well, my, in my, and the thing is my parents, actually, this is a crazy story. When I first started school, my parents were paying for everything. So mm. my, I came from a, I didn't come from like, you know, Anthony came from like, he, he had to work. Like Anthony came from tough, you know, Victor Antonio came from, as he says, poor, poor. I came from an upper middle class family. My dad's an attorney. My mom uh, is a nurse. And, you know, I had a really easy, good upbringing. I had a really nice family. Good, good parents, you know, taught me good lessons, taught me respect. So I, it wasn't like I was in a situation where I had to hard scrabble my way, bootstrap my way out. But in my freshman year, 
Uh, I, my roommates, a couple of my roommates I was living with, they were having to work really hard to, to make it. I mean, they didn't come from the, the families that I came from. And at the time, my dad was paying for my, you know, my rent and paying for school and my food was taken care of. My car was taken care of. I worked at his law firm, you know, clerking oh. there, you know, from time to time. And and I just started noticing that, you know, I just didn't feel like it was good for me. Like, I didn't feel like I was learning anything. I know this is weird, but I remember the day I stood in my parents' driveway and I told my dad, don't give me another dime. I'm going to figure this out on my own. Mm. And, uh, and I kept working for him. And it wasn't, there wasn't like, I wasn't like cutting myself off from my parents. I just said, don't give me any more money. I got to, I, I got to take responsibility and figure this out. So I did. And, uh, and so I, I, I must say my parents never helped me. They, they didn't, you know, yeah, because but, you, you see it go the opposite, right? Like if you, if you're coming from a wealthy family or an upper class, middle class, whatever you, you coin it, you'll typically see the majority of people get lazier, not work as hard, <laughs> but for some reason you've done the exact opposite you've like massively scaled your activity, your intentions, your work output. Yeah, I just, you know, for me, it was just, I mean, I just needed to earn it. So I did. And, and I, look, my dad is, was, is a phenomenally successful man. And, and he, you know, a, 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 one of the most respected jurists in the country, a, you know, lectured at Emory, uh, a judge. And awesome. one of my drives always was I wanted to make sure that I was honoring everything that he did for me by stepping up on what I'd been given. So it wasn't like, you know, a lot of people talk about privilege these days and I was privileged. I mean, I did have things that other people didn't have, but you honor that by stepping on it and moving to the next rung versus being comfortable in it. So for me, it was about, about, you know, about going further than what my dad had ever done. And so for a lot of my youth, it, I was driven by being more successful than my parents. Like that's what I wanted. And so it was ambition. It was those things. But when I was 23 years old, I, you know, I, I, it's a long story. We don't have time for the podcast, but I basically sold my way into being the manager of seven profit centers for Nutrisystem. So I'm, I'm managing people that are way older than me at 23 years old, running a wow. multi-million dollar business. What's, and, and by I, the way, for the audience that may not know, what is Nutrisystem? Well, Nutrisystem was a, uh, it was like Jenny Craig. It was a diet, a, a, you know, it was, it was a, a, you know, these diet places. These things oh you buy it online, right? But back then there were storefronts, right? So we had, I had seven storefronts across Georgia and South Carolina. And I was the area manager for that group at, at 23. All my peers were in their mid to late 30s who all had MBAs. But basically they said, you know, I, I went and applied for the job and they, you know, they basically said, you know, you got to go learn how to sell. You got to do all these things. And so I learned how to sell. And then I outsold everybody and I kept asking, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm selling more than anybody else. I want the job, want the job, want the job. And when the job opened up, I didn't give anybody a choice. So they gave me the job. No, and then, that's awesome. You know, and then I, I, I jumped out of there uh, during the early 90s and went to a much bigger company and started all over again at the very bottom of the company. When I was 24 years old, I was driving a truck for the company because I wanted to work for a big company. When I was wow. 34 years old, I was vice president of sales. So, you know, I was what, able what, to- What type of company, what, what type of products were uniform that? Uniform services, uniform services, the most unsexy product in the world, but man, big time cash flow, and if you can sell that, you can sell anything. And uniform services is that like a like a Cintas competitor? Yeah, like Cintas was my number one competitor. Wow. Yeah. So, so cool. yeah, so I did that for you know I did that you know went through the the, the ranks there. Was that maybe then, knocking on doors? I well I did it by phone, so I would call and set my appointments by phone. Some people did right. it by doors, but I you know I I it was heavy prospecting, heavy hunting. So yeah. knocking on doors, making phone calls, getting in, getting the deal done, advancing the sale selling something that was essentially a commodity and making it something that wasn't a commodity. Wow. So uh, differentiating, I was the number one salesperson at Aramark. I, you know, I've got trophy cases of trophies and it was, it was a great lesson. And I, you know, I rose to the organization. What do you think then, the secret was at the, the uniform services in Aramark? Like what, what allowed, what, what did you do differently than 99% of the people there? Well, number one thing is you got to prospect your butt off. So it was fill the pipeline, fill the pipeline, fill the pipeline. So every day you got to fill the pipeline. Number two is you got to understand that you're the differentiator. <coughs> the uniforms are all the same. I mean, uniforms, uniforms, uniform, right? Yep. The surfaces are pretty much all the same. Everything that everybody's doing is exactly the same. The differentiator is, can you solve problems? Can you get into somebody's operation? Can you run the system? Like, can you run the cell system, making the connection? asking the right questions, 
you know, bridging the gap between where they are and where they want to go, offering good solutions and, 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 and differentiating the product by how you sell, not what you sell. And I was good at it. Like it was, it was the, I ne- like I never in my life thought I would ever want to sell uniforms. I didn't really like the product itself, but I yeah. loved the puzzle. Like I loved being able to get in. I loved the competition. Uh, I loved the money. Like I made a lot of money. You know, <clears throat> if you go back and think, when I was, God, you know, this is 1994, 93, 94. I'm, you know, I'm in my early 20s. You know, I'm knocking down almost 300 grand selling uniforms. Yeah. So, awesome. I mean, so it was like, it was easy money. I say easy money, it was hard money, but it was good money. Mm-hmm. But it, more than anything, it, it made you become a good salesperson. Like you had to focus on sales as a process. Yeah, and it's so, not like you have to any new tech that yeah. would outsell yeah. anyone like a new Facebook and you're selling ad space on Facebook. It's like, yeah. if you can become a master at commodity selling like clothes or uniforms, you can sell anything in the world. Yeah, well, it was, you couldn't, if you showed up and throw it up, you were going to get killed. Like you're everybody yeah. else. All you're doing is price. If you show up and do a great job, you're going to win. And that's the key. As someone that's written so many books, you know, at a high level, how, how many copies of your books do you sell a year, you think? Um, probably 100K. I mean, I would say- 100,000 books. You know. So like someone that sells, prob- I, I'm maybe going to assume like at probably the most books in the sales category by far. I don't know if anyone's got you beat at 100K a year. Um, how do you avoid becoming egotistical, hungry, always learning? Because I feel like when you've got all that book sales, you've got everyone watching the university and stuff like a, a lot of, of us, I've been there, people have been there where you just let your, you, you slow down the learning or the optimization because you're just egotistical or whatever. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I've got, I've got this like constant thing. I'm always looking for the, what's going to kill me, right? What's going to take me out? So learning new things, learning new things, learning new things. And so I, I'm going to answer your question and I'm going to tell you a story. So it's hard, it's hard to, to keep the ego in check, especially when you started off with a big ego to begin with. Right. So I, I think that, you know, part of being in sales is you, you have to have a level of humility, but you also have to have a level of like this, this natural confidence that you can accomplish anything. Yeah. So you have to be I think you have to be aware of that. The hard thing for me, and this is being completely transparent, is the more popular the books have become, the more popular I've become, the hardest thing is, is that everybody wants a piece of you. So from text messages to emails to phone calls to LinkedIn to, you know, it's like everybody sounds like this. Hey, can can I just get 10 minutes of your time? We're doing a book club. Can you come talk to my group? And another person says, hey, could you just, I just want to pick your brain for just a minute. And, and could I do this? And could I do this? And could I do this? And it's just, it, it's, it's like, it never stops. Mm-hmm. So part of you is like, okay, look, I'm a badass. I've written 13 books. I'm, you know, I like, I did a keynote yesterday with 2,700 people. How many people get to do that? You know, right. I get top dollar for speeches. You know, the, the amount of money that I make per day now is just obscene compared to with where I started. Because when I started, it was, I tell you what. I won't charge you anything. Will you buy 10 copies of my books for your group? And, I, and I'll come speak. Like I spoke anywhere, anytime. Like if, if you would, if I would drive there, I would do anything. I've, I've crashed mm. fares, you name it. But today I have to have a conversation with my people all the time. I said, don't forget where we came from. Like, don't forget when, Ooh, you know, when, when we thought getting a thousand dollars to spend a day with a group of salespeople was a good thing. Like when that was awesome. And today, you know, we're saying it's forty thousand dollars. You know, we, d- don't forget that because we can't ever. As soon as we step out of that, we lose our ability to provide a good customer experience because because it's not it's not being egotistical; it's being arrogant, right? And so, mm. and 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 there's nothing wrong like with being authentic and being yourself and being those things, but. When you're when you forget your audience, right? When you quit being connected with your audience, that's when you start crossing into arrogance, and that's when you start, you know, you start making enemies. And frankly, you think about it: every single human buys a book. Like, if I could stop and just grab you and give you a hug and say thank you, like you went and bought something that I wrote, and you're consuming it, I don't want to ever, ever, ever forget that. But it's hard sometimes when. You know, you wake up every day and there's, you know, there's, you know, and this is not like being some superstar, but there's, you know, there's 300 people that day, then everybody wants to talk to you. Yeah. And, you and know, for the audience, just so you guys get aware of this, 
I've been trying to do this interview with Jeb for over two years. He was harder to get booked than the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. And I thought booking Jordan was hard. It took me a year of cold calling and prospecting to book Jordan. It took me two years to get Jeb on this podcast. So, I, dude, I totally get it. It's, totally and, get it's, it. and it's hard. People don't understand. Like, like A lot of people don't understand. Yesterday, I stood in front of audiences that were paying me from 7 o'clock in the morning all the way until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And so someone wants to grab, you know, and in between, I got a second, like when, before I got on here, I had 11 minutes exactly to eat my lunch. That's how long I had. So, so that's a hard thing. Like, so you have to be very, very careful. So for me, it is, it's, it's all about, I have to remind myself, be grateful, be grateful, be grateful. There is a fan Mm -hmm. out there that bought your book and and you, you know, you got to understand that and never forget where you came from. And it's hard with people who are in our organization now. You know, we're 26, 27 people in the company now. And, you know, we're, we're you know, we're, we're you know, we're, we're, you know, we're pushing into $25 million in sales. And it's Amazing. hard for people to think. And then they go, well, that, you know, they only want to pay us as much for that. And I'm like, there used to be a time in my life when someone brought that to me, it would have fainted. Like, I didn't even think I was worth that. So yeah. you don't forget it. And the beautiful thing is, you know, those, some of those relationships turn into long-term relationships. So I, so I think that's like, that's a really important thing. And it's the same thing in sales. I mean, you know, you're the number one salesperson. Listen, you're not competing with the person behind you anymore. You're competing with you. Like you're competing yeah. with your own head. You're competing with the, own, the stuff that's in your head. So, so for me, what's, what I'm starting to have to do now is like, I literally have to unplug for, a few days from social media, from everything it's gotten, I used to be like always on all the time. And now like there's these big gaps. Like I didn't even do a podcast for a month because I just, I just, I have to get away from it so that I can come back to it and not feel completely overwhelmed. And the worst thing, Brandon is in a lot of cases, I just feel like a schmuck because, you know, somebody says to me, Hey, you know, can you, can you come to my book club and can you spend, you know, 10 minutes with my people? And they're thinking, man, it's only 10 minutes. And, you know, and they're like, this is the greatest thing in the world. And six years ago, seven years ago, I would be on every one of those book clubs. Every, if you, if you ask me, yeah, you just, you, well, you, you only have a certain amount of hours in the day. I totally get it. It's, totally it's get tough, it. but it's, and, never, um, it's never 10 minutes. It's, it's 40 minutes. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. And, and just because we got, we've got a million viewers, hundred thousand plus subscribers, Jeb, everyone's dying to know the reason why they bought this book sales secrets and, and the podcast, you know, where we interview the world's best sales experts. If you had to go back in time, you lose everything, your company, you know, that's doing multiple eight figures, huge congrats. And by the way, guys, if you listen to those numbers, multiple eight figures, less than, you know, a few dozen employees, the amount of money that Jeb is making per employee headcount is, is unseen. One in the services space, two in the SaaS space, like, uh, so hats off to you, man. Huge congrats. It's absolutely amazing. But if you lost it all and you had to go back in and start from scratch tomorrow, like what would be the number one sales secret that you would leverage, that you would tell yourself that you would use to build it back up again? Hey, I, I'm actually, I'll tell you the real story. So in the great recession, so you go back, you know, go back 2007, 2008. I'm, I'm vice president of sales for a Fortune 200 company. I'm living large, right? I've got yeah. corner office. I've got two assistants. I'm, I, I live like a rock star. I travel all over the place, taking people out to dinner. And then one day it's all gone because the Great Recession happens and it turned out in the middle of a recession, the company didn't need a rock star riding around on a corporate jet, taking people out to dinner. So my entire identity, right, everything that I had was wrapped up in that particular role. The thing that I wanted more than anything else in the world was to be that vice president of sales. Like, I love sales that much. And it was all gone. Like, it was just Mm -hmm. like that. So I had to start all over again. In the middle of a recession, by the way, also, I was also one of the people who had a lot of real estate at the time. So I had a lot of stuff happening. And And, and are you talking, is this the 2007 to 9? or? Yeah, this was... Like for my age group, that was our Great Depression, right? Yeah, so, 100%. Like it, and I never believed I would ever be in a situation like that, ever. So, so you were the VP of sales and you have a shitload of real estate. Yeah, shitload of real estate. But the by the bull- way, did, 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 did not have anything foreclosed. I, every one of them I covered, right? And so I got like everything got taken away all of a mm-hmm. sudden. 
so I started sales gravy. Like I started my company. Like really? I, yeah. So, my, so I could've, basically I could've, they lay you off. You're like, I, I've got all this property I got to pay for. I got a family I got to take care of. Yep. And you're like, I'm going to start my own thing. I'm going to start my own company. And i like, what do I know how to do? Horses and sell stuff. Well, I can't make any money on horses. So I'm going to, I'm going to sell stuff. And so I built sales gravy and, and, and what did I do? I prospected like, what's the secret? I hustled. So I, when I, when I started sales gravy, I'm like, I started thinking about, you know, what, what, what are the things that I worried about the most? And when I was a vice president of sales, I worried about turnover. What we were always doing, we were always hiring salespeople. So right in the middle of the, the worst financial device, disaster of my generation, I started an online job board. So I, I kicked that off in 2008. So I, I started in 2007, you know, wrote my first book, got into mm-hmm. podcasting, did all these things. 2008, I kicked off the job board. By 2010, we're the market share leader in our space. And we sold job board like SaaS, right? So instead of selling a job post, I sold a job post subscription. Why? Because most people who are hiring salespeople are always hiring salespeople. Yep. So by 2010, I'm printing money. Like I've got, I'm, wow. I'm stuffing money everywhere. I'm the only employee. How did I get there? The, my sales secret. With the day I started the company, I picked up the damn phone and I called somebody that I knew and said, hey, I'm doing this. And I prospected and I prospected and I prospected. Now, I was building this future, the future I'm in right now as, uh, you know, as a sales training company. I built the job board because I needed cash flow in order to build this company that I'm in right now that produces like this is way more profitable and it's way bigger. I don't have to buy advertising and I have to do arbitrage with different pay per click stuff. I'm out serving people. But I couldn't build that then. I mean, I could have, but I would have starved to death. I had to, I had to feed my real estate fortune. And I had to feed my family, and I had yeah. to, you know, I had to pay for my obligations, things that I had, you know, I had made a commitment to do. So, I built that. I prospected, prospected, prospected. At the very beginning of this thing, Brandon, here's what I did. I went all around. I lived in Florida at the time. I went all around Florida to job fairs, and I would take a little flyer that says, "Post your job on Sales Gravy. First job is free." And I would go to job fairs. I wouldn't pay to get in because I'm broke. Like I'm like, I'm bootstrap broke. Yeah. So I go to job fairs and I, and I would go to each of the individual booths and I would give my flyer and I'm looking for security because somebody would call security and I would get tossed out. Like they would grab me by my arms and throw me out. And I did this and I would go around and go around and go around. And then when I got a little bit more money, I got on airplanes and I started going to big conventions all over the country where salespeople would be in mm-hmm. their booths. And I would go to every single booth and usually I would sneak in and I would go around and I would collect business cards from the salespeople and I would hand my flyer out. And, and what happened was slowly but surely I started getting people on. And by 2000, a little bit late 2009, I signed my first two big enterprise accounts. I signed Verizon and I signed ADP. Wow. And, and the reason I brought on ADP was I met one of their recruiters at one of those job fairs and got them on. And then, and then she introduced me to another recruiter and then introduced me to another recruiter. And so I had 11 recruiters on before I went and, and met with the person who headed that up. But I prospected. What's the sell secret? Talk with people. Like the only way you're going to fill up a pipeline is talk with people. The number one reason you're going to fail in sales and fail as an entrepreneur is that you don't have a full pipeline. And the reason you have a full pipeline is you're not prospecting every day, every day, every day, every day. So I went all the way back to I'm, um, you know, 24 years old in the uniform business. What's the first lesson my sales manager taught me? Come in the morning, get on the phone, call people, ask for time. That's it. Because that's all prospecting is, is asking for time. Yep. And you're going to ask for time and you're going to fail and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to do those things. And that's what I did. And wow. I just go back to, you know what? I'm not the smartest. I'm not the brightest. I was bootstrapping, you know, writing code, programming, doing all kinds of other stuff. At one point, I had like three different email addresses and phone numbers. So I had different names. So I'm the customer service rep. I'm the <laughs> salesperson. Like yeah. I'm doing, I'm taking all these calls. I'm, re, I'm, I'm like recruiter relations. I did all of that stuff. And I was working, like, I don't remember. I don't re, really don't remember 2008, 2009, 2010. I, I'm, I didn't sleep. So I don't really yeah. have a lot of memory other than it was working. So what's my secret? Pick up the damn phone, prospect, knock on doors, knock them down, smoke signal, carrier pigeon. It doesn't make a difference. Get You got to talk with people. And, and then once you, once you get them to give you time, you know, if you, if you have enough conversations, you're going you're gonna to win. And that's what I did. Damn. Pick up the damn phone, hustle, talk with the people, 
and fill the pipeline. Jeb Blunt. So what happened? So the the job board thing, you blew that up, and then d- did you like transition out of that to the training company, or did you, you like is you saw so, that going while you're doing the training company, or what happened? So, How did you so both at the same time? So the one of the problems with the job board is the job board um, started to consume us. Like when I first built the job board, all I wanted was cash flow so I could yeah. invest in the training company, right? So I just wanted to have enough money to pay for the training company, and I live. And I've always lived an austere lifestyle, so I don't have some, you know, I don't, I'm not feeding cars and houses and all kinds of stuff like that. Real estate was an investment portfolio for me, but in the middle of the recession, it was a, it was an awful portfolio. Yeah. Taken, and it's taken a while to get all that back. But the, but the, but the, but the, but the point was, I wanted to be a, a sales trainer. So nobody really, like, nobody knew me, knew anything. I'm writing books along the way. The problem is the job board blew up, and it started consuming everything. And I mean, it was a, and it was just pushing off cash. Like every single month, the credit card payments were coming in every single month. So I started hiring people, bringing people in. And then I, the big break for me was that in 2011, I picked up a big consulting project for a company that was building another SaaS company who, who brought me in and I had to get people working for me. And I had to bring in someone to like handle my finances in the middle of all that, like to watch the money while I was out. So it forced me to get out of the business. So I had to rise above that. And that was a big turning point because it was like this pivot point where I felt like I, I learned that I could bring people on and trust them to run the business while, you know, I was doing other things. So, so that, that began to work. And then we kept the job board all the way through until the spring of 2019, spring of 2019. Wow. Yep. So spring of 2019, we killed it. Now, at, the, at that time, it was not nearly as big as it was before. I still had a sales team dedicated to it, uh, learned a lot from it, built it out. But it, I mean, it was still, you know, a million dollar a year business. Yeah. And, and sounds so like we, the training company just took off. The and training probably, company's going. That was your goal. Going. Yeah. But, the, but it was my baby. So my team, the executives that I was putting around me were saying, we need to kill the job board. The job board is holding us back. And I'm like, ah, you know, it's my baby. I built it. You know, it's still there. Nobody likes working on it. Nobody, it was the customer, you know, it was customer service hell. It was just a lot of stuff with it. Yeah. Nobody likes you. Everybody hates you because you post a job, you're the hero. You post a job, they don't feel it. You're not the hero. I mean, it's just really simple. Mm-hmm. So in the, in June of 2000, May of 2019, we killed it. And at the same time, we're ramping up Sales Gravy University. So we took, we took, we took the job board, took a million dollars off the top line, right? Ah. The drop through wasn't as good because we were having to buy a lot of advertising to arbitrage. Like, so for example, yeah. you bought the job board, I had to go pay, get pay-per-click in order to get traffic yeah. here. And, those and I had to be very out. careful. Dang. Exactly. So, yeah. so we killed it. And then we ramped up Sales Gravy University. Well, it took us two months and we covered all of the revenue from wow. the, you know, from wow. the job board and we, and we're having more fun. And, and we grew like in 2020, I think our growth was like 200 and our 2,500%, you know, year over year. And, and our monthly growth is like 500%. We grow, we grow, we grow, we grow, we grow. So the, the, the South Grove University has been a really good play for us. But it's a, you know, it's a, it's more of a CEO lesson. Like sometimes you got to let go of something that feels like you're letting go of a lot in yeah. order to gain the time and the focus to focus on something that's good. And it's the, it's the people that you put around you that, you know, that are telling you and you start listening to them and you let it go, but it was hard. Like they would let it go. like something died. Like I, I remember mm-hmm. I just mourned that day, you know, because yeah. I had built this thing like from the ground up and I'd worked so hard on it and I have, I had so much emotion wrapped up. It was in like it. your first entrepreneurial baby, man. Yeah, it was. I, I it was. It was. And, and, you know, some people say, why didn't you sell it? And I'm like, you know, I, it's, it would have been a hard thing to detach it from the sales gravy brand. And, and I did it wasn't even worth it. It just wasn't worth the time and effort. And so we just, we just yeah. let it go. But That's that awesome. was a, that was a big turning point. And it, and, and by letting it go, we gained all this oxygen to focus on other things. And so we went from, you know, a growth trajectory like this to a growth trajectory like this. That's insane. And is it just that the model is just much more scalable with sales grave university? Is that it's, not why? It's, it's more scalable and it's, it's, uh, it's better. It's easier. It, uh, it generates a lot of, I get a lot of VC calls because the, the people want to invest in e-learning. Uh, cool. and, uh, so we get, a, you know, it's, it's just a different animal and people yeah. are happier. Like our customers are happy because they're on their learning and, yeah. 
it's it's uh, it's given us wings. It's been able to we've been able to connect the dots and. Because uh, that growth and, is insane. The, the yeah, it's, I mean, the, the growth that we're experiencing is it's unbelievable. And it's hard to sustain. It wears you out. Like, yeah, well, you gotta, you're, you're probably like, going to have to continue to keep adding the headcount to this 25 person well, team. It's, 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 it, well, we just, we, I know. And we're, we just added some, a couple more people. We just added, uh, we just had, we bought a managing, brought on a managing director to run outbound. I mean, we're, you know, wow. we're, but the, I think the biggest thing That's is huge. it's the, it's the, it's the never ending. Once you get on the MRR bandwagon, right? Oh yeah. You, you like every day you wake up and you feel pressure and you feel crap, you know, and like what am I going to do now to to, yep. to keep this thing moving? So it's just a it's That's a amazing. good thing, but it's a I, you know, it's a it's p- part of our story. We we iterate, we iterate, we iterate just being in the studio complex I love if, you'd have, if you'd have complex. been here, if you'd have stood where I'm standing right now in the in February of 2018, this was dirt. So, uh, you know, sick. yeah, and it's just the hustle picking up that, you know, to, to wrap it back up to the secrets before we go to rapid fire, because I know Jeb's got another interview coming up. Um, the sales secret, pick up the damn phone. You got to hustle. You got to prospect. You got to fill the pipeline. And uh, no matter what, that's what you got to do. And, and that's what Jeb would do. If he lost it all, he lost it all in 2007, 2009. Now he runs a multiple eight figure company that's, uh, you know, impacting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Huge congratulations big mentor of mine and many other uh, entrepreneurs, salespeople, marketers out there. Now for the rapid fire question. So I want, this is rapid fire Q&A real quick, few minutes. Um, what is your favorite habit? My favorite habit? I don't know. I don't know that I have a favorite. I'm trying to think of what habits I have. I'm so random. And so like, I'm so random. You do um, systems for sales and everything. And then you, you I know, you but I don't really have like, I don't like, I don't really have like habits. I don't have, I just don't, I like, if I would think about it, I don't really have a group of habits and, and all the habits I've ever had were bad habits. Like, so <laughs> it's like, it's not like I have a, a like a good habit. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know that I can answer that question. Like I really think about it. I don't know that I have any, like somebody asked me the other day, what, what's your, what, like, what's your routine? I'm like, I don't really have one. I, my, my only routine is every morning I wake up and, the, and I spend the first hour of my day answering people's questions and, and communication to me on social media sites. So really, I just oh, go through oh, that's that a habit. It's a habit, but it's not my favorite habit. It wears me. It just wears me out. My favorite habit is every morning I take a really long hot shower and mm. I think. And Dude, and I, the, and the only so thing awesome. that pisses me off is if it could be a two hour shower, it still wouldn't be long enough because I get so much done. Dude, I, I love that. That's hilarious. I, I was telling my fiance the same thing. Like, I feel like my best ideas are from the shower. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, what is your favorite book? Uh, would be uh, How to Win Friends and, and uh, Influence People, Dale Carnegie, without without hesitation, and a book that every single human being should read every single year, every year. <laughs> great question. Great, great book. Uh, how do you stay motivated? Uh, I don't. I don't really have to like have something that keeps me motivated. I just am. And it's a it's a drive that's on the inside. I think that the, the I think the bigger issue is how do I keep from uh, burning myself out, and and I do, and I, I run like really hard. So you know, for example, 2019 before COVID, I spent 311 nights in a hotel room. Wow! So like that's a lot. And that's a lot. That's almost so a full if, year. That's like ten months or whatever. So it is. So you, if you think about that, you know, it's 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 I have to schedule downtime to allow myself to breathe mm. so that I can recharge a little bit. And that's wow. really been probably the hardest thing for me recently is, is getting that, that downtime. But I wake up in the morning motivated. Like I'm, I, awesome. if I'm, you know, the, at, like, you know, you were talking about Anthony and arena, like he's my very best friend in the world. I talk to him every day. Awesome. My wife says you talk to Anthony more than you talk to me. So, and that's probably true. But one of the ways that I stay motivated is if Anthony gets a win or does something, it just makes me angry. So like I gotta, I've gotta work harder because you know because he's accomplishing something, and I'm sure I do exactly the same thing to him. And I'm happy for him. Don't get me wrong. Don't get. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, I'm not jealous, and I'm not resentful. But it pisses me off that he got there first. So I've gotta like I gotta I've gotta one up him. And it's been a really important relationship in my life having someone that constantly challenges me. I can't. I believe that guy that. didn't bring you in as an investor in Seamless, dude. I, I, yeah, I don't, money X returns right now. That, I'm yeah, I don't know. That. I don't know what's wrong with Anthony. You know, yeah, like he's I got said, some issues. 
I, I and then when you get stuck, so next question, how, how do you get unstuck? So if you crash and burn, you get burned out because you're on the, the road or whatever, like when you're down and out, what, what is the thing that you do to get, get back up? I drink scotch. <laughs> no, 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 I, no, I think, um, I think, I think everybody gets down and out like everybody does. And the only way to get to overcome being down and out is to do something. So, so mm -hmm. let's just think about getting stuck. I get stuck writing sometimes. Like, so yep. I, if I get stuck, I just walk away from it and then I come back. Sometimes I get stuck and the way that I get unstuck is I just do like I write, 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 or I try something, try something, try something. And the act of, of actually taking action in a lot of cases gets you unstuck. The mm. biggest issue is that. is that people people are perfectionists. Like they're they're trying to be perfect in everything, yeah. and 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 so they're stuck because they're worrying about what might happen if they're not perfect. So they're just you know they're paralyzed by perfection. For mm. me, it's do make a mistake, do make a mistake, do make a mistake, do make a mistake. Forget failure fast. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. So for me, the biggest way to get unstuck is to do something. Just do something. God, that's sense. such great advice. That's so baller. Um, just do something, take action. I love that. And then last question of the interview, advice to your 20-year-old self about anything. What advice well, would you give? Enjoy it more. So, I, look, I had a great, I had great 20s. I had great 30s. I had great 40s. I mean, they were all great. Like, I, it was great. And, uh, and by the way, I'm at least 10 years younger than Anthony Anarino. Don't let him tell you anything. Like he's a, he is an old fart. Yeah, I'm better I'm, looking. For the record, Jeb Lott, better looking than Anthony. Yeah, I'm better looking and I'm way younger. Okay, so, but, but I was so ambitious in my 20s. When I say ambitious, I mean, I was ambitious, looking for the next thing. And I was, and I worked so hard to get where I was. And I worked on some great teams with some great people. We had some great victories. There were things that I got to experience that most people don't. And I didn't savor it. Like I, I, I you know, and, and I look, and it's easy to look back with hindsight and say, you know, savor it. But there are mm. things that, that if I really were to sit down and just let myself, you know, slip into the past, which I don't do. But if I did that, there are definitely regrets. And all of those regrets are almost always for not taking enough time in a particular moment or not spending more time with a particular person or not enjoying something, or when I had a choice between two equal but opposing things, I sometimes didn't pick the thing that I would remember the most. I picked the thing that was harder work. So if, but my biggest advice to myself would be to stop and smell the roses. That also is the advice that I would like to give my 50-year-old self, because I still have the same problem. And yep. I, and I don't like I I'm still haven't figured out how to get over it. I'm trying to enjoy things more. The one thing that I will tell, you know, 20 and 30 and 40 year olds, because I am 50, uh, a little over 50. But this is this is hands down the happiest time of my life. Like I, I I've, awesome. I've never been happier. And people said that to me. You're like, you get, you're going to get older. You're going to be happy. It sucks being old. Like I want to be young and strong and cool like you. Right. But. There is a there is a level of contentment and happiness that I run into from time to time up until the point somebody else that I know writes a book and then I'm not content anymore. And now I have to go write a book because I'm so freaking competitive that I got to yep. go win again. And that's the mental illness. So I don't. So something's wrong with me. I don't know. That's it. Dude, I, I love that. And, and what what caused, you know, why are you so happy? Now? Like, what, what do you think caused that happiness now? Is it like finally realizing you got to smell the roses more? Or what, like, where do you think that gratefulness came from? I, I, th I think it's because I can relax a little bit, right? I can at least say, okay, you know, I, if I, like Mike Weinberg always says, he goes, he goes, he'll grab me sometimes and I'll go, dude, are, do you realize what you've done? Like, do you ever like stop and just think about what you've accomplished? And, and like most of the time I think, like nobody knows me. Nobody's reading my books. Nobody's doing this. I got to work harder. I got to get it out there. I got to do this. Yep. I got to do this. Like most of the time, I'm, I don't think that way. Most of the time I'm thinking I'm behind the eight ball. I'm losing. I got to, I got to yep. work harder. And, and so sometimes I'll stop and I'll go, you know, we really have done something amazing. And I think some of it is you get to a point where you know, you have a business that's sustainable. Like it's not, if, if, if I got hit by a bus with the right leadership, we could, we could keep yep. going on. Uh, so I think oh. it's that. I just think it's, I think a lot of it's just, it's just the point where you go, 
you know, I, I did it. You know, you, you got, you got, you got here. Uh, Amazing. but on the flip side of that, I'm like, okay, well, I've got 30, 35 more years to go. I mean, some people are thinking like, you know, 80, I'm never retiring. What's yeah. that going to look like? Yeah. I love that. It sounds like we both, and probably many listeners who tune in to sales secrets, we accomplish a goal and then we move the goalposts. So it's this yeah. never ending goalpost moving. A lot of people look at that as bad thing. I think that's a good thing. I think that's yeah. awesome. Those are traits of people that are, are uber successful. Jeblon, thank you so much for joining us on Sales Secrets. I know you got to run. Before we go, where can the audience follow you, connect with you for more? Go to uh, go to salesgravy.com. Find me there. Go to jebblunt.com, B-L-O-U-N-T.com. Follow me there. You can check my podcast out, the Sales Gravy Podcast. Been podcasting since 2007, so really, really long on the podcast world. And uh, you can catch me on Twitter at Sales Gravy, Instagram at Sales Gravy, LinkedIn, just type my name in, uh, YouTube forward slash Sales Gravy, Facebook forward slash Sales Gravy. So wherever you, wherever you find the gravy, you'll probably find me.